I wish you a pleasant morning and I would like to start with session number three, Digital Solutions for Supply Chain Due Diligence, a reality check for companies. And Alexander Graf is going to host it. You have met him yesterday. He is the coordinator of the resourcing project here at the Vienna University of Economics and Business. He has significant experience in EU and international supply so sustainability agenda, sorry, with the special focus on the responsible sourcing of min mineral raw materials along the global supply chain. And he also worked in circular economy and responsible research in and innovation and in international development. And he's specialized in multi-stakeholder collaboration and knowledge ex exchange. And I would like to hand over to Alex to start the session three. Thank you, Ursula, for your kind introduction. And yeah, hello and welcome also from my side um, to this session three of the Resource and Virtual Conference uh, this year. And what we basically going to try to do uh, over roughly the next one and a half hours is to have a bit of a deep dive into this rather hot and emerging topic of, well, digital or technological solutions for supply chain due diligence and transparency. Uh, companies are increasingly held accountable, uh, not only for their sustainability in their own operations, but actually also um, about or uh, uh, help being held accountable for what's happening in their supply chains, so throughout their supply chains. And therefore, they are increasingly pushed by different actors uh, to collect and assess vast amounts of information, may it be on raw material flows, uh, may it be on supply chain actors and their sustainability performance. And this is, of course, connected to a multitude of uh, different challenges uh, resulting mainly from, well, on the one hand, the area of um, uh, global uh, supply chain complexity, and on the other hand, of course, a fierce price-oriented market competition. At the same time, we can uh, observe over the last year the emergence of a variety of different uh, digital and technolog uh, technological solutions uh, that try to offer kind of ways of how to manage and automatize these uh, information flows in order to increase uh, uh, transparency and deal with uh, due diligence. And um, looking at the situations, many companies are actually still just starting actually uh, to explore and understand the situation and what it actually means uh, uh, for them, how to navigate this space uh, that is rather fragmented in terms of what is expected from them, what are the solutions out there, and what to in the end adopt and implement. And against this background, uh, in this session, we will try to provide a bit of a, let's call it reality check. Um, in terms of or along three lines. Uh, one is uh, the basic question, where do we actually stand with these technologies? Uh, blockchain, but not only blockchain, other digital solutions uh, such as data spaces, peer-to-peer -peer exchange, material passports, etc. cetera. Um, what to expect from them and what are the major challenges connected? A second topic uh, we will also have a look into is uh, the topic of collaboration. Collaboration in terms of well, collaboration is needed in order to make these solutions work, but also in terms of uh, how can these solutions actually help us uh, to collaborate in order to improve, uh, in the end, uh, responsible sourcing of uh, raw materials. And lastly, um, as I just said, actually, also the topic of impact, which you would like to have a look into. How can these uh, uh, technologies, these solutions actually be used to achieve actual impact also uh, and improve uh, the situation on the ground? And I'm very happy, actually, and pleased to uh, welcome uh, a number of expert speakers. We will follow the same kind of format as we did yesterday already. So we have first uh, some input presentations followed by um, a panel discussion. And I would directly like to jump into the input presentations. And I'm very much pleased to um, introduce our two uh, speakers in this regard. Uh, first, I would like to uh, warmly welcome Rashad uh, Abelson from the OECD. Um, Rashad is um, basically a legal expert at the OECD Center for Responsible Business Conduct, where he's part of the team working on due diligence standards. 
Uh, his, work, uh, his work focuses mainly on the government implementation of OECD commitments on due diligence, uh, but it also includes research and development of tools that support due diligence practice more generally. And this more recently also is then connected uh, to his work actually on digital technology. And in this regard, he's also the co-author of a 2019 OECD report entitled is there a role of blockchain in responsible supply chains? So um, a very well, uh, a very warm welcome to you, Rashad. And um, I would also like to introduce uh, Audrey, Audrey Dalus from KPMG. Audrey has over 10 years of experience in the global technology industry. She has extensive knowledge of supply chain issues and also uh, the challenges that companies are actually facing in this regard. Uh, she, Audrey worked actually with various clients and also led different teams to implement supply chain software modules, among them, for example, ERP uh, systems, but also traceability software, including blockchain, in order to improve supply chain transparency. Again, a very warm welcome to you, Audrey. Um, we are very happy actually to have you both here. And actually, without further ado, I would like to uh, hand over to you, uh, Rashad, um, as our first presenter. Thanks, Alex, and, and thanks everyone for, for having me. Uh, this is a, a great discussion and, and we're happy to contribute. So uh, I'll jump right into it. Um, uh, as Alex said, I'm with the OECD Center for Responsible Business Conduct. Uh, a, a brief intro on who we are and what we do for those who aren't familiar. Um, we're an international organization um, charged with uh, developing government-backed standards on business behavior. So in particular, uh, on today's topic of discussion, which is responsible supply chains. Um, this involves advising our governments, but also advising business on how to identify, prevent, and mitigate negative impacts uh, in business operations through the implementation of the uh, OECD due diligence guidance for responsible mineral supply chains. This is a, a legal instrument uh, developed by our governments and, and, and backed and approved by our governments. Um, we support governments and companies through focused research, through development of due diligence tools, trainings, awareness raising, um, and also through coordination among policymakers so that there is a coherent, consistent international approach uh, to policymaking on this topic. Um, with this presentation, I want to introduce you uh, a bit more to the OECD standard on responsible sourcing. Um, and, and I'll talk about how technology can help overcome some of the challenges associated with responsible sourcing and some broader considerations for governments and companies to keep in mind when, when choosing to apply uh, technology as a supply chain due diligence solution. Um, uh, a lot more detailed discussion on these issues can be found uh, in a paper uh, that our team wrote that, that Alex uh, mentioned uh, earlier. Um, uh, our team co-authored this with uh, Audrey's team at KPMG. And, and while that paper and my intervention today are generally focused on these blockchain, um, almost all of what I discussed can be applied to other technological solutions uh, to support due diligence uh, and sustainable economic development in mining communities. So uh, keep that in mind as I go through. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Back one slide, there we go. So uh, I'll focus first on the standard for those who are less familiar. So the, the OECD guidance provides companies with a common framework and detailed recommendations uh, on how they can identify and address negative impacts uh, in their supply chains and then make progressive improvements to manage those impacts over time in a transparent way. Um, it's directed at all companies in the mineral sector. So from miners, large and small, artisanal and small scale mining, ASM, up to LSM, uh, it's for exporters, for refiners, and then all the way down the supply chain to the uh, product manufacturers and the retailers. Um, it also covers all mineral supply chains. So not just uh, so-called conflict minerals, but, but also uh, minerals critical to the green transition and, and as well as precious uh, stones. Um, implementation of the guidance is a legal requirement for certain companies and in many jurisdictions. Uh, particularly as new legislation uh, is emerging every year on this issue. I think notable legislation includes the uh, U.S. Dodd-Frank Act uh, uh, Conflict Minerals Rule and the EU Conflict Minerals Regulation, uh, but there are many others that are, that are popping up that are either fully or partially integrating the requirements uh, of the guidance. Um, and because the recommendations of the guidance are to cascade due diligence expectations to suppliers and sub-suppliers, uh, many tiers up and down your supply chain, these legal requirements, um, even though focused in specific jurisdictions, actually have far reaching effects. Um, the approach recommended in the guidance isn't like the typical compliance approach uh, that companies might be familiar with. 
Um, and that's because our objective with this instrument is to promote responsible investment and sustained engagement in mining communities. What we'd like to avoid specifically and what I'll get into with this blockchain uh, discussion is seeing de-risking uh, from certain mining areas through disengagement from those areas. So we want continued sustained engagement to slowly and progressively over time uh, mitigate those risks and, 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 and uh, results in sustainable economic development for mining communities. Um, engagement with artisanal and small scale mining in particular is critical for mineral supply chains. So ASM represents a significant share of mineral production um, across various minerals. And I think the latest estimates by the World Bank and, and, and PACT, which is an NGO that does research in this field, uh, are that ASM employs about 45 million people globally uh, with the livelihoods of millions more uh, sustained through ASM and other uh, economic activity around uh, ASM uh, mines. Um, now, ASM is a particularly informal activity and, and the challenges around uh, ASM uh, addressing the negative impacts on their sites um, are uh, quite difficult to overcome, but that is not to say that ASM is more or less risky than LSM. Um, on the contrary, uh, issues such as corruption, money laundering, child labor, sexual exploitation and, and other human rights abuses also take place in large scale and industrial mine sites uh, as well. Um, but the vulnerability and lack of capacity for ASM make it much harder for them to address these issues and then overcome challenges to uh, enter the, the, the legal and responsible uh, mining market. So one of the key messages that I'd like to relay with this presentation is that companies should be using technology to engage responsibly with all of their supply chains, not just LSM. Um, in order to overcome these challenges and to drive positive change, uh, thereby you know, achieving the objectives of the OEC guidance. Can you go to the next slide, please? So uh, now to get into the, the technological solutions. Um, uh, the, the reason I focus on blockchain specifically is that uh, it is probably one of the most tailored solutions for supply chain management uh, that, that we've come across and then was and, and still is to a certain extent one of the most hyped uh, digital due diligence solutions. Um, starting four years ago, when the excitement around blockchain was really starting to build, the OECD started an informal mapping of the various initiatives that were popping up. And in the mineral space alone, uh, we also mapped the garment and agriculture spaces. Uh, we found like significant number of initiatives related to gold supply chains, to cobalt, diamond, tin, tantalum, uh, and, and the list has gotten even bigger since then. And uh, with all this hype, it made understanding the potential for blockchain, uh, especially confusing for companies and policymakers. Uh, so that was the impetus behind this research paper that we drafted to look uh, deeper into the, 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 the solution. Um, our approach to this paper was really technology uh, agnostic. We weren't trying to promote one form of traceability or, or chain of custody system over another. Uh, we were just trying to understand the topic and, and inform our stakeholders on, on, on how they can use it. Um, so, so what challenges uh, does the technology seek to address? Um, well, as, as I'm sure you know, supply chains are extremely complex and fragmented. Um, Alex hinted at this in, in his intro. Um, it, this makes it particularly difficult to track where the goods are coming from and also makes it difficult to understand who's handling your goods, uh, which are both key sets of information for, for understanding um, risks and impacts in your supply chain. Um, and then due to the formal and informal nature of certain actors in your supply chain and then different levels of strength of governing institutions uh, globally, uh, it's really uh, a significant challenge to ensure the accuracy of reported information um, that you're getting. So uh, it's also well known in this space that some of the biggest challenges uh, for supply chain due diligence have been the financing of, uh, of mine sites and the cost burden of implementing due diligence cha uh, changes uh, necessary to, to meet international uh, uh, standards. Can we go to the next slide, please? So how does blockchain propose to address those challenges that I just mentioned? Um, well, with all of the relevant supply chain actors mapped out and agreeing on a common blockchain framework, the blockchain can allow for faster, more secure, and potentially more accurate supply chain visibility. Uh, this in turn can lead to more easily identifying fraud and anomalies in your supply chain and more transparency into who's handling the goods. Um, likewise, you have a virtual currency and self-executing contracts that could allow for better bankability to, to vulnerable groups who might struggle for access to, to legal sources of finance. So, so blockchain really presents uh, a lot of the um, uh, desired outcomes that we wanna see through supply chain due diligence. And can we go to the next slide? 
So that all sounds great. Why don't all companies uh, just adopt this solution? Uh, well, adopting a blockchain solution or, or frankly any other data gathering technology would require overcoming serious hurdles uh, related to value chain cooperation. Um, this includes getting the supply chain to agree on a standard data model, on rules of governance, on interoperability, and, and on rules of uh, transparency. Uh, many companies have invested significant time and money in their own databases and won't be easily convinced to spend more time and more money to adopt this new model, um, especially if it only affected a narrow aspect of their supply chain management. Um, you also have informal or less sophisticated supply chain actors and operations, um, specifically ASM, but also smaller trading operations and refining operations uh, that tend to rely on older, sometimes even paper-based system um, or other kind of low technology solutions. So adopting a new technology might create a barrier uh, to entry for them to participate in these legitimate markets. So, so these are critical challenges that would take a large investment of time and money uh, to try and overcome. And in practice, what we've seen is that companies that are currently using blockchain are more likely to use them to um, uh, better gather information from their industrial actors and their supply chains rather than through these smaller actors. And uh, engagement with ASM through blockchain is, is, is largely non-existent. There have been some small case studies, but um, we haven't seen the widespread adoption that uh, was suggested by all the hype and all the concept notes that popped up several years ago. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? So, so in the end, uh, the main findings of our paper were, were not really surprising. Uh, blockchain is a powerful technology with the potential to achieve a lot of good with regards to supply chain due diligence, um, and, uh, but it's not for everyone. Um, it's, it's critical for anyone considering this model to keep in mind that blockchain traceability cannot replace on the ground due diligence and actual engagement at the mine site. Um, while blockchain can help companies more effectively detect uh, otherwise difficult to catch data anomalies and, and other issues in supply chains, uh, they cannot find and report on uh, the risks, that, that so-called first mile uh, problem uh, that we've heard so much about in the blockchain space. That uh, you know, a detailed review and interview process and on-site visits with staff uh, can, can help identify. Um, so, so people on the ground and reporting their findings could still be necessary despite a, a well-functioning blockchain system. Um, another important finding uh, is that in order to avoid barriers to entry uh, to some of the most vulnerable supply chain actors, um, value chain cooperation discussions um, should include representation uh, from, from a variety of stakeholders. So that includes worker organizations, representatives of mining communities, and international and local NGOs uh, to make sure that those barriers of entry are, are, uh, are reduced. Uh, what we like to say is that uh, for, for these smaller actors, the standards aren't lower, but maybe the ramp to get to those standards uh, is at a different angle. So uh, what, that, what essentially that means is that maybe these smaller actors need a little more time and a little more investment uh, to, to overcome the basic due diligence hurdles, but that doesn't mean uh, that the standards are lower for them. It just means that companies should rethink the way they, they interact with them. And, and uh, if blockchain is properly implemented, uh, that, that could be uh, done. And can we get the, the last slide, please? So here are some broader considerations and recommendations. I'll let you take a look at the paper uh, to read through those in more detail. Um, it's actually essentially repeating a lot of what I just said. Uh, so value chain cooperation is necessary. All actors should be consulted. Blockchain isn't for everyone, but then those companies that do use it and, and do use it properly um, could unlock a lot of potential. So uh, that's, uh, that's all for me. And wait, actually, that final point, um, technology should facilitate market access, uh, not act as an additional barrier. Um, so that's my final point. Thank you very much. Thanks uh, a lot, uh, Rashad, for this uh, very nice overview, actually. And um, I would like to keep actually questions for after both presentations. Um, just a reminder to everyone, feel free to use the Q&A function. Uh, you can both ask questions, but also comment and, and like others. Um, yeah, with having said that, Audrey, I would like to directly hand over to you and your presentation. Thank you, Alexander, and good morning, everyone. Very happy to be here. So Rashad presented a very exhaustive perspective. So I will try to focus on the business dimension of that presentation and uh, starting with next slide. 
So businesses are under increasing pressure to build transparent and sustainable supply chain, or at least we expect them to make their best efforts uh, toward more uh, sustainable supply chain. So main group uh, creating pressure are customers, 63%, uh, investor, 48%, and regulators, 46%. And uh, for a company, it really has become a key topic to address. Uh, indeed, uh, if you look at numbers, 77% uh, of the companies by spend worldwide are reporting on sustainability. Based on some survey conducted, um, supply chain transparency has become a strategic topic for 69% of respondents, and investing in responsible sourcing has become a priority according to 93% of respondents. And this is not likely to change um, due to uh, new regulations uh, coming in. So to support this, um, supply chain technologies will play uh, and are already playing a crucial role. Uh, and that's why, according to Gartner, we will see in the next three to five years um, an increase in the adoption of digital uh, supply chain technology. So in this presentation, I will touch upon the approach that companies are taking in regards to responsible sourcing, um, some technology outlook, and please note that 10 minutes is quite a short uh, time, uh, and there, is a, there are a lot to say, so I really try to uh, present things in the simple way, and that's why I'm going to focus on um, explaining centralized platform versus distributed platform, or commonly called blockchain, in line with popular usage of the term, even though um, purists would say that it's not blockchain, but that's yeah what um, um, the uh, it's commonly called by um, the market. And then I will finish with the lesson learned. So if we move into the uh, next slide, thank you. So if you look at a responsible sourcing approach uh, from different companies, so at the top you go from risk avoidance into uh, positive impact. And that start with uh, compliance. So you ensure legal obligation are met. So that could be, for instance, um, minimal wage on the social port or some um, environmental uh, regulation based on uh, business permitted re related to um, noise, energy, waste, air and soil pollution. And there are quite some law that are coming in uh, or already there. Um, the German Supply Chain uh, Due Diligence Act or Lieferketten Gazette is one of them, um, but there are also many others. So if, if you move um, beyond, then you reach the uh, strategic level, and that relates to um, how a company wants to position itself in the market. So that's actually focusing on not doing hurt. So that could be, for instance, on the social port and the living wage, um, or on the environmental port, um, that could be reducing greenhouse gas emission, uh, adapt to climate change, uh, etc. And um, here, some of the drivers are investors and employees, but that could also be a bit of consumers. And then if you move at the top, uh, trying to create some positive impacts, um, that's where typically what you see is companies uh, working with their ecosystem. So that includes as well competitors uh, and they work together towards common goals for the greater good. And here they, they focus on creating positive impacts. And um, typically what you will see is some topics around uh, deforestation, um, biodiversity or regenerative agri agriculture. So some company focus on one of those three uh, steps or pillars. Um, but that could also be a combination of all three. Uh, there is not uh, right or wrong. Uh, and of course, to support in um, the implementation and monitoring of those approach, data needs to be collected through the end-to-end -end supply chain, so beyond tier one, beyond your direct supplier. And this, this is where technology plays uh, a crucial role. So most of the time, companies start using Excel or um, exchanges by emails, um, but uh, to collect some information, but they quickly see that uh, it has its limitation huh? in terms of uh, data aggregation. It's very manual process. There is no single version of the truth. And that's quite some time and effort spends uh, trying to reconcile the data and actually having insights from those data. 
So um, here comes another struggle for companies. So which technology or which solution should I choose? Um, and that's um, the uh, technological outlook that I'm providing in the next slide. So um, basically, and again, a very simplified uh, explanation. Uh, so you have what I call, what we call centralized platform where you have a centralized database behind. So what does it mean? It means that the data is stored in a single location. So we have different options. Uh, option one on the, on the left, um, so a company owns the platform and they provide access or not to uh, their suppliers. So they can actually log in um, and um, provide their data and uh, the data are, is, are stored there. Um, so you can collect information through the chain, but it's more in a cascading way. Uh, so you will start with your direct supplier and then you go beyond via some, for instance, cascading questionnaire that will allow you to collect data through the chain. You have another option that you can use with this type of platform. So that's option two on the right side. Um, so here at the central port, here is um, a neutral party. So the neutral party will own the platform. So that could be, for instance, uh, industry initiative. Um, that could be um, like ET, SCI, uh, the um, team supply chain initiative, or that could be a software provider uh, representing multiple players. Um, so companies and company supplier or competitors can directly log into the platform and provide some information. Uh, everything related to permission so who is able to access which data uh, can be set by the central party um, because of course we want to avoid competitors to see a sensible data from each other and uh, here that what we see is that the governance is usually the main challenge and is defined by the neutral party in accordance most of the time with their members on the next slide it's um, an outlook of distributed platforms. So what I, um, I referred to previously commonly called as blockchain, um, but yeah, yeah. So you have distributed platform and decentralized platform, but here we will focus on the dis distributed one. So what you can see here um, is that um, there is um, a database that is held and updated independently by each participants from a large network. And companies and company suppliers, but also competitors can log into this platform and no single entity is the owner of the system. That's the, 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 the key difference. And the participants can have a copy of the ledger um, that will maintain a single source of trust. And here again, co uh, governance uh, is a big challenge and that could be managed by a consortium, for instance. But uh, you still need a third party to uh, maintain the system, and that in this case will be the software provider. So my point here, and what I'm trying to explain, and again, 10 minutes is quite short, so I really try to simplify it, is that if you look for a solution allowing you to connect with your ecosystem and to get data from different parties in the end-to-end -end value chain, uh, you can do it either with traditional platforms, so the uh, centralized platform, that's the option two that I showed in the previous slide, or distributed one. So it all depends on who you best trust to store, um, maintain and manage your data and set the permission matrix and governance. So yes, blockchain has interesting features, um, but the type of technology shouldn't be by itself a strong criteria enough to select a solution. And um, that brings me to the next slide on the lesson room, starting with the uh, technology consideration on the top uh, left. Um, so th there are hundreds of software uh, that can be used for responsible so uh, sourcing or due diligence purpose. And most of the time companies struggle to navigate this. So my really main recommendation is about really focusing on uh, functionalities rather than technologies. Um, and what you need to think about when you select your solution is your, of course, immediate needs. Uh, but also potential future evolutions. Um, and because it's very difficult to anticipate how tomorrow will look like, uh, companies, I mean, the, the recommendation is to opt for a flexible solution that can easily adapt over time. And um, by doing so, you need also to keep in mind that 
technology is not, is a mean to an end and it won't solve everything uh, unless you have a strong pro program behind. And as mentioned by Rashad, it will not replace the work you need to do on the ground. Um, so what's, what is important is really to identify your goals and, and then the data and technology you need to uh, achieve those. And that relates to my second point on the top right. Um, so companies trying to track every data of every project will just drown because it's really too much time and effort compared to the uh, benefits. Um, and again, you need to think about your end goal and what you're trying to achieve and then defi define what data you need. So sometimes it can be as simple as an audit document, a certificate or answering a questionnaire. And other times it can require a lot more um, to um, achieve your, your final goal. Um, brings me to my uh, third point on the, at the uh, bottom left, uh, define values for suppliers. So what's in it for them? Why should or would they share their data? And this is often very difficult ones and that needs to be addressed in early stage of the project. And that's also depend really on your uh, buying power uh, on position in the chain. And um, last one, but not least, uh, I, I will always recommend to think big, but start small and build it up. Yes, you need to think about what the potential evolution of the software could be for the future needs. Um, but when you design the requirement of the system uh, in the implementation stage, you always start small and extend. Otherwise, um, it takes too much time before having a live system. And also because it's easier to go back in case the software does not deliver um, on its promises. And as the investment will be smaller at the beginning, it will be easier to go back. Because the, the, the issue is that sometimes we see uh, companies, once they have a tool, they try to get a return on investment at all costs. So they really build complicated uh, layers of application and that really becomes complex to handle. And um, they, they try to develop uh, functionalities, make the tool evolve. And sometimes it's more expensive than changing the tools uh, for one with a better fit for purpose. So I guess this is it. Um, if I, uh, so in the next slide, I uh, provided some additional readings. Uh, so if I understood pro pro properly, you have access to a resource library where you should find uh, those uh, readings. And they are related to supply chain transparency and the role of blockchain responsible supply chain, um, as mentioned by uh, the, the paper mentioned by uh, Rashad. Uh, so um, yeah, you, you can go through them if you want to know more uh, about the topics and of course, avail always available um, to discuss uh, sorry, those in more details. Thanks. Thank you so much, Audrey, also to you for this uh, very concise, actually, introduction. Also, that shows us very well already and gives us some hints about, uh, well, actually, business perspectives, as you also said in your title. And um, I already noted down, actually, a few buzzwords and comments from both of your presentations, actually, that I'm pretty certain we will pick up in, in our uh, conversation and panel discussion. So starting from, well, of course, be clear about the purpose and not track everything um, to what you both mentioned, actually blockchain is an, or digital solutions in general are means to an end, another end in them in itself. Uh, and also actually the very important hint uh, from you, uh, Rashad, the, consider the entries, uh, barrier entries uh, or entry barriers, sorry, entry barriers also, especially for smaller actors. Um, I'm just looking, I think we do have at least one or two minutes for some questions, and I can see already at least one in the in the Q&A, which uh, goes directly to you, Rashad, um, and which I find actually very interesting, because this is also a point that we will certainly pick up in our conversation, I'm pretty sure. It's about the issue of data verification, also when it comes to blockchain, and uh, the, the issue of, um, uh, as it's called here, crap in, crap out, or garbage in, garbage out. In, um, uh, in, potential, in the potential of blockchain and what it actually means uh, in terms of do we still need someone like a trustworthy agent on site or not in that sense. Yeah, maybe Rashad, you can comment on this. I mean, uh, yeah, you, you answered it, uh, we still do. Uh, a blockchain is uh, a specific solution for verifying specific data, uh, but, but certain data just we can't be trusted unless there's uh, a human element um, either on the ground at the mine site or, or through a trusted uh, organization that's that's on the ground at the mine site. So 
uh, yeah, uh, it, it's, there was a lot of initial presentations of, of blockchain um, in this context being presented as a panacea, the tool that could do everything, uh, but that's, that's certainly not true. It could do a lot and, and do a lot very well, but um, it's, it, it can't replace on the ground due diligence. And, and I'll let the technical experts speak to the, the, the crap in, crap out uh, 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 problem uh, with certain data uploaded to the blockchain. Um, but, but when it comes to uh, interviews with stakeholders on the ground, uh, the blockchain can't do that. Uh, that, that. That takes the human element on the mind site um, or, or, or in, in, in other circumstances. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Rashad. And uh, maybe from my side, um, now to both of you and Audrey, as you are definitely more expert than I am when it comes to uh, the side of blockchain, actually the, the architecture and what it is about. Uh, based on this issue of garbage in, garbage out now, if I were to try to kind of summarize what is actually the most important feature um, of blockchain solutions for supply chain uh, transparency, as opposed to, well, why not using just a normal database uh, solution, for example? Um, uh, would it be still correct to say, well, in the end, it is this uh, feature of trustlessness, trustlessness in the sense uh, that once the data is on the blockchain, so we're not talking about store uh, bringing it onto the uh, blockchain, but once the data is there, uh, it can be trusted because it cannot be altered or changed anymore um, 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 without other participants knowing, so to say. And this is, of course, a big um, um, plus, a big, a big advantage when it's about um, transparency in that sense, Yeah, which does not solve the issue of garbage in, garbage out, but at least once it's up there. Yeah? Would that understanding be correct or would you, would you disagree or would you, would you kind of, of add to that? Yeah, so I, I think that's indeed a good point on huh? the, the, the immutability of the system um, in the sense that um, you cannot delete uh, what's there. No, that doesn't solve the garbage in, garbage out, but what type of solution solve this today? What you need to, to put in place is some controls um, just to raise flags in case of something which is not consistent happens. So that could be some volume check or some um, other checks. Um, and, and yes, it all comes to, at the end, who are you going to trust with your data, with um, the permission metrics, et cetera. And this is really more um, for companies to decide based on their uh, use case. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Audrey. Rashad, would you like to, to add? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree with that. And, and just to add a, another, I think, powerful element of blockchain is, is the self-executing contracts and, and, and virtual currency element um, in terms of uh, offering alternative financial solutions to, to difficult uh, to, to bank with uh, actors in the supply chain. So that's something traditional databases obviously can't, uh, can't do. So, um, and, and, and a really valuable aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Thanks, yeah, perfect. Um, I'll also note this one down because I'm pretty sure it will be it will be mentioned also during the panel discussion. Um, Audrey, just very quickly, let's say one, two minutes, not more than I would like to move on. Uh, more a question out of personal interest. Also, I find it I found it quite interesting when you showed the pyramid actually and the different um, um, kind of uh, well motivations and also drivers uh, for supply chain transparency from risk mitigation to really kind of achieving positive impact in the end. And as I just said, you also mentioned some of the main drivers, but in your research, uh, did you discover, or in this research, um, um, could you find also some trends or patterns as to, for example, which types of companies or which industries are more on the one side or more on the other side? Or is this something where I say this is still too early to say or any kind of, of additional, yeah, as I just said, trends or patterns? Yes. Yeah, so what we saw is that um, in the food and beverage industry, for instance, they're a bit more advanced uh, simply because when it comes to food safety, there are way more um, um, obligation that needs to be met. Um, so yeah, they, they try to be a bit more in advance, but we also see that in other in industry, they are um, catching up. And that's why we, we see a lot of initiative popping in uh, or being there for quite some time and trying to really um, work together towards common goals. Okay, cool. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Audrey. And I think with that, I would uh, like to thank both of you again, Rashad and Audrey, for this uh, really interesting insights and input presentation. I think we have a lot of food for thought and a good overview now 
um, to directly uh, go into the panel discussion. And I would maybe just like to invite you to stay on a bit and see maybe whether there's still coming up some questions in the Q&A, which you can actually then still answer also. So in, in written form, and this is again, of course, a, a bit of, of a push also to the audience, uh, feel free, don't hesitate uh, just to drop us messages in the Q&A, we are happy to answer. So thanks to you, Rashad and Audrey. Um, I would like to move now to uh, the panel discussion. And I'm very pleased actually to uh, have four more speakers uh, present today. Um, just give me one second. I will invite everyone to uh, uh, start the video so that we can also see the faces uh, in real and not just the photos, <laughs> the pictures. Um, exactly, perfect. So yeah, um, uh, a very well, uh, a very warm welcome to all of you. Um, a quick introduction, of course, is in place. And uh, I would like to start uh, with uh, Nathan Williams, Nathan Williams from MindSpider. Uh, Nathan is the founder and CEO of MindSpider, a very well known blockchain uh, traceability platform for the mining uh, and raw material sector. And as a genuine blockchain expert, Nathan uh, is also facilitating blockchain workshops, for example, for the UNECE or uh, the World Economic Forum. Um, and he's also uh, frequently featured, well, in, for example, Bloom Bloomberg, Forbes, Huffington Post, Wire Germany. So I think we can really learn a lot from his uh, uh, blockchain expertise. Thanks for joining us and, and welcome, Nathan. Uh, next, I would also like to uh, introduce Tanya Matveva. Uh, Tanya is an experienced uh, exploration geologist and worked with various communities across uh, many countries, actually. And based on her experiences, also including uh, the handling of vast data sets, she then decided to found her own company, Comni Chain. Uh, and Comni Chain is basically focused on advanced uh, on advancing blockchain technology in the mining industry. Um, so another blockchain expert here with Tanya. And uh, thanks for joining us, Tanya. Thank you. Um, then we have Anna Stanka from the Responsible Minerals Initiative. Uh, Anna is a sustainability expert and project manager uh, who joined the Responsible Minerals Initiative in 2021 uh, with a focus on impact and innovation. Uh, prior to the Responsible Minerals Initiative, she already worked for business associations uh, where she uh, mainly assisted retailers and vendors uh, to implement and innovate their due diligence systems um, uh, across different industries. Uh, she also uh, worked as a technical advisor and consultant for the United Nations and German Development Agency. So with Anna, we have a true expert when it comes especially to due diligence in that sense. So hello, Anna. Hi, good morning, everyone. And uh, then also a very well, uh, warm welcome to uh, Niels Angel from BMW. Uh, Niels uh, has worked for the BMW uh, group since the late 1990s in various functions from purchasing to finance uh, and also headed the department uh, that was responsible for the corporate strategy on responsible purchasing slash procurement. Uh, currently, he is uh, leading uh, the sustainability team on the so-called Catena X initiative. Catena X, we will hear a bit more about that, is another digital solution, if you want, that is not directly um, um, related to blockchain as such. Uh, and in his position, Niels is then responsible for the efforts to measure, report, and reduce uh, carbon emissions, as well as the digitalization of sustainability information via peer-to-peer -peer data exchange. And I think that peer-to-peer -peer data exchange is already an important buzzword in the context of uh, Katena X, actually. So yeah, uh, very warm welcome to you, Niels, also, and thanks for being here today. Yeah, thank you, Alexander, and I'm very happy to be here this morning. Yeah, cool. Uh, with that in mind, I um, would actually directly like to jump into our discussion. And uh, just quickly, again, the reminder to everyone, use your Q&A. We will try to bring in your questions uh, whenever they pop up. And also to our panelists, please um, use the raise hand function that you can see at the bottom of the Zoom uh, uh, webinar uh, whenever you would like to kind of come in or add actually comments um, uh, to the questions or uh, to the discussion in that sense. So just feel free uh, to come in. 
Um, yeah, as I said initially, um, we would like to uh, dive deeper into actually three main areas and starting with the first one, um, the most obvious one, where do we actually stand with this kind of uh, digital solutions for supply chain due diligence? What are the main challenges, et cetera, and what to expect? Um, I would like to ask a bit for a temperature measure, the first question to you, Anna. Uh, based on your experience with the with the RMI, uh, so we heard a lot uh, now from from Rashad and and Audrey already about a bit about the business perspectives on the one hand, and on the other hand also about well what are the major challenges. But um, as the Responsible Minerals Initiative has actually a lot of contact with companies, not only upstream but also further downstreams, um, what is actually the impression and the feedback that you get? from them um, when it comes to due diligence? Is that a pressure that they really feel? Um, is that something really a hot topic that is more and more coming up in this regard? And if so, um, how is their take on blockchain and other digital solutions in this regard? Um, do they see this as a game changer? Is this a hot topic for them? What are the concerns in this regard? Just to see a bit um, from your perspective and from your dealing with companies. Anna. Thank you, Alex. Uh, and yeah, you asked me a very packed question, so I'll try to yes. unpack it a bit and take it step by step. Mm -hmm. um, maybe just to give it some context, the Responsible Mineral Initiative is indeed an initiative that is dedicated to responsible mineral sourcing. And as you said, we work very closely to companies in sectors that are sourcing, transforming, retailing products that contain minerals, and that can be electronics, automotive, but in, in today's world, really, we find we found metals in every product. We find batteries in, in many products. So it also ranges from toy producers to household appliances producers, uh, uh, medical device producers, and so on and so forth. So I will speak a bit from the point of view of what we hear from our member companies and the, the experiences and the concerns that they can have. And maybe I'll start saying that um, the question of supply chain transparency and the need for traceability is, is not new. It's not a, a question that just came up today. It has been there for quite some time. And really the drivers of it have to uh, be found in what Rashad was mentioning. So the regulatory development that um, started a few years ago with Dodd-Frank and also more recently with the EU Comfort Mineral Regulations, really expecting companies to know the provenance of their, of their goods containing minerals and metals and uh, to be able to evaluate risks of associations with conflicts, with human rights abuses or with bribery and corruption. So that drive has been there for quite some time and indeed it has gone hand in hand with the with the search for solutions, for technology solutions that could facilitate the, um, the traceability of a product and also the, the collection, the storage, the analysis of data that is required to undertake then that level of due diligence. Um, now, more recently, I think there has been a new impetus and, and um, um, a new um, wave of attention that has been brought to those dis digital solutions by new regulatory developments. And we have to, to think particularly in, in the European space of the EU battery regulations, but also of the upcoming proxetoria due diligence regulation that really ask companies, particularly in the downstream portions of the supply chain, of um, being able to trace the, the, their products, so having a traceability of chain of custody system in place, and also being able then to um, know and react on um, potential human rights related, environmental related risks that are connected to their supply chains. So that, uh, um, that new stream sort of, of regulatory development has really drawn renew, refreshed attention to the need to identify technology solutions that could help them for that purpose. And I think we also need to keep in mind that at the same time in the in the, in the green space, in a way, there is um, um, a drive towards the circular economy. And with companies seeking to establish circular business models, again, there is a need to be able to trace the provenance of products and to also um, record and, and, and store uh, attributes of those products that will then enable the reuse, the recycle, the repurpose of the products. So there is this two, the, these two streams that in a way are, um, are bringing new pressures and also new attention on, on companies in terms of um, increasing transparency of their supply chain 
And what is new there, I think, that uh, is that um, while the traditional responsible sourcing regulations were putting a lot of responsibility on the midstream and on the upstream of supply chains, today is also very much the downstream. So the brands, the retailers, um, the, the manufacturers that are feeling that need to increase transparency in the supply chains. Now, in this context, blockchain, as well as other technology solutions, really present uh, an opportunity and they are, they are seen as a, as a promising venue to increase transparency by many of the companies that, that are working in the mineral sector. Nonetheless, when it comes to the actual adoption or testing of those technologies, we do hear a number of hesitations and, and concerns or challenges that are being raised both in the downstream and also in the mid and upstream. And um, I might risk to be, to be a bit artificial here, but maybe I can categorize those concerns in, in two blocks. Um, so if we, if we hear what the main hesitations are from downstream companies, then the first word that everyone will hear when talking about digital solution or blockchains is going to be interoperability. And um, from that point of view, I think the perspective is really that of a large retailer or a large brand company that is heading supply chains, which are multi-tiered, which are very complex in that they include hundreds and thousands of suppliers um, geographically spread in many different locations, where the concern for, for, um, for a brand or for a manufacturer is looking at a product that entails several di different components with several minerals and thinking of the scenario where each of those minerals or each of those components might be traced using a different blockchain solution. No. So that in a way is, is the main concern in terms of how can those technologies speak with each other? How can we make sure that we achieve economies of scales that we don't duplicate and that data is also comparable? Um, so that's, that's one of the elements of interoperability. On the other end, there is also a concern of the downstream uh, in terms of what the introduction of blockchain technology will mean in terms of resource investment, in terms of workload for their suppliers. Thinking of the fact that several companies might be purchasing the same product from a certain supplier and they might have slightly different ask for data. So again, um, a, a mainstream and standardization of of that of the data, of those data needs and also of the language which is used to identify the, the data sort of a taxonomy is really one of the concerns of uh, that that holds back company in a way uh, it's almost like companies wanting to have certain level of reassurance on the fact that yes interoperability is possible and yes there is a standardized language a common language through which different solution can speak and through through which data can be can be transferred before um, the, uh, the step can be taken. Mm -hmm. um, now, another, another range of concerns that we hear relates to the fact that um, technology is always linked to a human factor. So the inputting of data within the technology relies on, um, on the staff, on the, on, the, on the people who are doing that inputting, and of course requires a level of, of competence, of, of training. And there is there a question of, how do we make sure that the data that are inputted in the system are accurate, that they are a correct representation of what we are trying to, uh, to capture? Because the beauty of, of blockchain of, and of those technologies is that they can almost offer real-time information, but that information is only as valuable as it is at the time when it is inputted. So if as the, the audience was saying, if garbage goes in, then that is what will travel through the system as well. Um, so that with that concern comes also the question of how we can practically link the, um, the digital technologies to sources of verification, which already exist. We have many certification systems, we have inspection and audits, which are already established, but they are not necessarily designed to speak to those technologies. So the question is there, can we integrate these two words? The, the third party verification, the, um, the, the, the trusted party verification in a way with what goes into the technology. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Um, if it's okay, I would, I, I would try to, 
to leave it for the moment with uh, with that because I think we, we got so much input already and and we will catch we will we will try to 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 pick up on that anyway especially I think the points on interoperability I think you hit the nail and we will we will come back to that uh, a bit later um, if that's okay I would like to kind of uh, um, directly move on to you Nathan and ask a bit of a question again back to 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 challenges and 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 uh, concerns uh, when it comes to the implementation of blockchain blockchain solutions and it is basically a similar question I asked Rashad already but now from your perspective as you are someone who is directly developing and implementing uh, a blockchain solution with clients with companies uh, from your experience what is actually the biggest challenge that you are facing uh, or what companies are facing when implementing these solutions is it more on the technological side is it more on the non-technological side um, yeah just your take uh, very quickly on that one people don't know what they want that's the okay. biggest challenge. <laughs> it's, the thing is, we're talking about a really complex arena, right? We're talking about, uh, about everything from upstream due diligence. We want to know, can we automate that? Can we make sure that that's you know, secure? We're talking about cross-border transactions. Can we get better data so that uh, we can automate that and make that secure? Mm -hmm. We're talking about downstream assurance. Can we protect our brands and make sure that we're you know, not contributing to uh, forced labor or uh, making sure that we're at least compliant with laws or we have uh, reduced risk supply chains? These are all different problems. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the, and, and <clears throat> when we're starting to think about a technology solution, um, you know, blockchain is a very good tool. It's another tool in our belt to get better data. Uh, and then we, but what we often do is because we don't really have defined what the most important aspect of the problem is that we want to deal with mm -hmm. first, we tend to think of all of the solutions, you know, whatever. Uh, and, and then we try and say, okay, well, how can we blockchainize that? Now, the problem also is that the usually the people who know the problems or feel the problems or have the problems or interact with the problems on a day-to-day -day basis are not technological people. And the, and so then when you're trying to design a solution for these problems, you're, you're the people that are engaged in the, in the dialogue are not people that really understand how the technology works. So, it, and, but on the same side, when you get technological people who understand how the technology works, they often don't understand the problems and the complexities of the supply chain that you're dealing with. So it really, uh, uh, it, this is one of the, the the big challenges. And even though that there's a lot of you know uh, different efforts that are going out there, the slowness in adoption comes from this complexity and this mismatch between uh, people that sort of understand how to build a solution and people who understand sort of the, the, the complexities of the problem. I'll mm -hmm. give you an example very quickly. There is a big difference between a chain of custody solution from mine to smelter, right? That, that's one problem that you might be dealing with mm -hmm. versus the uh, mapping out compliance supply chains for a battery or for an electric vehicle. Now, you might be able to use the same technology, the same digital platform to get both managed, but the data that you'll collect, how you will collect it, how you will secure it is very, very different. And getting those two to talk together is going to be hard because in the middle, you've got also the traders. And so this idea of we're going to map everything as it comes out of the ground until it melts down, until it turns into a, a, a component, into a circuit board, into a product, into a car, um, understandably is overwhelming because I think that that's, uh, and in a way that that's not realistic. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can't solve a lot of these problems if we start dealing with the most salient uh, and the most pressing issues first. Um, mm -hmm. So that's sort of like the overview. And whenever we're talking about things like interoperability, I like I'm the biggest wet blanket in here. We can make data from one system to another, no problem. But um, usually, the I feel we're getting ahead of ourselves when we talk about blockchain interoperability because we haven't defined exactly what we want to interoperate. Like I, I've got an API on my system. We can get data off it and onto something else. But the question is. 
Will it be as secure? Is that good enough? What's for practical purposes? Usually the people that talk about interoperability are talking about, I don't want to be subject to a single service provider. And that's a legitimate concern. Um, that said, getting two blockchains to interoperate in a technological sense is like sewing a cat and a dog together. And so um, the, the real question is, what do we want to interoperate? How do we want to interoperate uh, it to interoperate? And we can't really answer those questions until the field is more mature with people enacting things at scale. And once they're enacted at scale in a production environment, which we are seeing now, which is actually very encouraging, then we can start to say, okay, we've got this section operating at scale. This, uh, the, the, the cross-border stuff is operating at a production capacity. How can, now we need that to interoperate with the, the mind to smelter chain of custody so that we got, uh, so that we've got, you know, a secure supply chain. How can we make that happen? And, and, and we can iterate in that way, as opposed to I coming think, top down and doing I think, it. I think, Mason, I would like to, to stop you on this one simply because I will come back to precisely this, uh, this question um, um, at a later point. Uh, because I think, yeah, um, again, you're hitting the nail with the interoperability question and, uh, point, and I will have some some more pointed and 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 maybe provocative question to you also in in in, in this regard. Then, um, but other than that, I think the key messages I took away from your comment in terms of challenges is, on the one hand, actually very much what uh, um, actually both Rashad and and especially also Audrey mentioned. So, uh, as a company, be clear about the focus. Uh, don't try to do everything. Um, um, know the purpose. What you actually try to achieve. And on the other hand, also this point of the interaction between, let's call it the tech people and the non-tech people in this regard is, is, is a kind of important point. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks for this, Nathan. Um, staying a bit uh, still in the sphere of challenges, Tanya, I would like to turn to you a bit now. And um, we heard from Rashad also this uh, important point. He mentioned the ASM sector. He mentioned uh, to be considerate about the entry barriers, especially for smaller actors. So the SME uh, in this regard. And uh, as we all know, um, the uh, um, the uh, due diligence and supply chain transparency in general is usually a burden, especially for small actors. But what is your take actually then when it comes to blockchain actually? Um, is blockchain a way out of this? Uh, does it support also smaller actors? What are the challenges and concerns in this regard? Um, um, yeah, or would you even say blockchain? Well, it's anyway the same for everyone. So there's a one size fits all uh, approach. So a bit the relation, smaller actors, blockchain. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, Alex. Uh, first of all, I have to thank everybody for excellent presentation. Uh, very good, I think, setup of the scene here for our discussion. Of course, I have to yeah. congratulate Nathan for inventing the word blockchainize. You should actually trademark it. Uh, I've never heard that before. Um, I think it has a great potential. Um, I would turn the problem here on its head. Right now, a lot of miners see this blockchain as an extra expense is something that they have to do. They ask to do it. They need to do it to comply with their requirements of their clients. And what needs to be communicated, and this is, again, the problem that Nathan just you know outlined, that we all live in different worlds. There is a mining world and there is a blockchain world and there is no connection. And this is where I sit here, um, is that they can actually benefit from this technology. Yes, you can show where your metals are coming from. And as a mining company, they don't need to know where the metals are coming from. They know. But there are all these additional elements, you know, like the payments, like the smart contracts, et cetera, et cetera, that mining companies themselves will benefit from. And right now, it just so happened that right now, blockchain technology is mainly used for tracking where materials are coming from. But there is a huge potential for the mining industry, like other industries, like oil and gas, like construction, like logistics, to benefit from the blockchain technology. And I think this is where the uh, focus uh, needs to be. And then uh, all these, you know, small enterprises, ASM, uh, look at our, you know, organic coffee, this or organic uh, cotton. This is already, you know, blossoming. We just need to tell the ASM Look, what does it, does it matter whether you grow coffee and small sell small batches or if you sell small batches of your concentrate? Learn from them and adopt it. Uh, but don't don't do it as like you have to do it in order to comply and it's an extra expense and it's scary and unpleasant. Uh, show them what are the benefits of it and, uh, and then it will take off. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you, Tanya. Um, so yeah, I noted down actually some of the benefits that you mentioned in general also, uh, which is also relates a bit to a question that I would have had later in terms of, well, what is there actually in terms of, uh, on top of mere, let's say, reporting or compliance or, or, or business, uh, what business case may there be? Um, and maybe we'll come back to that later as well. Um, other than that, I take your point. Well, we have some lessons learned already also from other sectors. And I think this is something we should uh, we should take up on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Niels, I would also like to come to you now. Um, particularly interested uh, to get a few insights from you now on Catena X, actually, because as I mentioned initially, Catena X is a bit of a different approach to, well, uh, digital supply chain transparency, but still a very interesting one. And uh, so I would like to give you the floor to perhaps one or two minutes, give a quick introduction what this actually is about. Just to let you know, uh, in yesterday's session, we already had a question about Catena X. Um, so okay. people are aware about it. Um, um, uh, I think this is also interesting. Uh, and then I would just like to ask you, take the opportunity then also when talking about Catena X, maybe let us know what was the motivation actually for BMW to join Catena X? What are the challenges you are facing in this regard uh, when it comes to this solution? Yeah. Yeah. I'm happy to do that. I think I sent you a slide. I don't know if you um, can share that. Exactly. I would like to ask our technical support exactly. I think it's popping up already. So don't, don't worry, it's just one slide. Um, <laughs> I think it's a bit easier to, uh, to explain then. Um, so we, Catena X, we are an initiative which set out to digitize the automotive value chain. I've written supply chain here because this is more my turf, but in fact, the aim is to connect um, over the whole value chain, also including um, recyclers, dealerships, um, but also the, the upstream side, um, the industry supplying us. This is a, a big challenge because it, it involves somebody estimated 275,000 legal entities that have different sizes, um, different needs, and different locations all over the globe. Um, we, we believe that we, we should do that in a, in a peer to peer network, it has been mentioned before, what, what are the different kinds of networks? So here we set out to, to build it on a peer-to-peer -peer exchange with a high degree of data sovereignty, uh, data security, a longer chain so that companies can be sure that they only share the data um, with whom they want to share the data and for the purpose they, they want to share. There's te technology here, not, not a blockchain per se, but um, some open, open source connectors um, doing the connecting here, doing automated contracting, and um, yeah, building, building a network here, not for the purpose of um, sustainability alone, but also for other purposes, I'm coming to that later. Maybe um, explaining first who, who are we? Um, we? We started off as a research project, we also got some funding from the German government. There, were, there are 28 companies um, in the Catena X consortium, which are mainly German companies, uh, German automotive manufacturers, but also um, application software providers, um, small and medium-sized enterprises. We, we actually uh, made a, a conscious effort to include them because they are the backbone of the, the automotive industry and we need to, to look into their needs to connect um, to this network, uh, but also some associations. We also founded an association to um, involve more companies which are um, not part of the initial group and um, I think there are more than 125 members now which are not German only but um, uh, we're reaching out to uh, first inside Europe to, to, to European um, partners but also now to, to other regions in the world because the, the automotive value chain is global and if you want to um, um, to, to build a network uh, connecting that we need to have a global reach. Um, there was a question about the motivation. Um, the, the motivation is that there are many challenges uh, which have come up in, in recent years which involved um, the entire supply chain, which involved um, parts of the, the value chain which we are not connected, which we don't have much transparency yet. Uh, these are not exclusively sustainability issues, but sustainability is a big, um, a big part of that. But others are, yeah, um, semiconductor demand and capacity management, 
quality issues over the value chain, manufacturing as a service. Um, so there are um, currently 10 use cases. And um, as was explained in the introduction, um, I'm heading the one uh, dealing with the, um, the sustainability um, issues here and the one, uh, the, the first product, the first application we are trying to build is a peer-to-peer -peer exchange for product carbon footprint to measure the footprint of, of the products um, in the production phase. And most of these emissions are in the entire supply chain with, let's say, aluminium manufacture, steelworks, battery, the battery supply chain. But we are also um, having some thoughts about um, using it for due diligence, um, 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 for human rights, environmental um, issues over the chain, because um, yeah, if you have the, if you have built the connections, you can use it to exchange um, many kinds of data. Mm -hmm. It is also important that, um, and, and, um, there's also part of the motivation why, why we um, help to, to set it up that um, we want to use um, um, technology to, to, to digitize the supply chain because we cannot do it in any other way. It's too complex, but also provide a degree of data sovereignty, data security for the, the members and, because, and not have a data lake where all the data comes together because what is a big issue here are um, a question of trust, what happens to the data? Is it used for other purposes than it was originally intended? Can it be used for, for things which um, impede competitiveness of the companies providing the data? How can we um, overcome these, the, these questions of trust, which are a big, big impediment to, to sharing data over the value chains? Mm -hmm. And um, so we build a lot of um, uh, safe stops, um, failures in the in the design of the network, and and uh, committed some some uh, a lot of um, thinking. Um, how can we um, we safeguard the data? Can we make sure that companies can be sure that um, um, that, that they can be sure what happens to the data and that it's not open, for example, to competitors? How the supply chain looks like mm -hmm. that um, it's not open, let's say for cost analysis and, and things like that. Um, Thank you. And it's Thank important you, that we address that. Perfect. I think on the last point, the, there will be also a question on that. Just a, big, a bit of, uh, as a follow-up also to understand the scale actually of Catena X and the project. So is the ambition to say really to, to have kind of a large scale mapping and, and um, kind of traceability of the entire supply network? That you have in there or is it a more targeted approach in terms of well uh, risk management uh, identifying the hotspots and only trace those uh, uh, kind of uh, um, points and nodes in the supply chain uh, the, the the ambition is to connect the the, the whole um, value chain okay uh, we yeah. have to be realistic that we will are going to start out with um, focused um, supply chains, which are important for the use cases. But since there are so many use cases, they will have different different value chains important to them. For circular economy, you have a different uh, uh, different set of relevant um, parts of the, the value chain than, let's say, for uh, carbon emissions uh, footprinting or for um, quality use cases. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks so much, actually, because um, you mentioned these 10 use cases, and this uh, also goes back into the direction, um, the question of business cases and use cases on top of, well, mere reporting, compliance, etc. So I think this is very helpful. And uh, actually, I would like to, to ask you or invite you if you have some link or some information on that, you can also just share it either in the chat, or you can share it with resourcing, and we are happy to circulate that because I think if, if this can be circulated, because I think this is definitely something to learn. Um, well, there is the there is the a, a Catena X website which is really accessible and also has this slide mm -hmm. on, mm -hmm. um, and there's a presentation and also a, a way to contact um, for more information if you if you're interested. Happy to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Uh, 
Thanks on this one. Um, maybe um, because you mentioned it already, um, Niels, I would like to stay with you and move on now a bit to the topic of collaboration also. Uh, collaboration, cooperation, and I believe that Catena X as a, as a network, as a peer-to-peer -peer exchange network, may be a, particular, uh, a particularly good um, showcase. Uh, yesterday during the session, actually collaboration was one of the main topics or key takeaways uh, that simply collaboration along the supply chain or along the network is actually highly needed. There was even uh, the statement that as such, there is no supply chain at the moment because, well, there is no chain, it's so disconnected. Um, so what is needed is the connection, but not just connection in that sense, but really connection for um, collaboration, uh, engagement, et cetera, beyond mere reporting, compliance, et cetera. Um, on the other hand, and this is what I would like to you ask, uh, what I would like to ask you, Niels, now is we all know that collaboration is needed in, in in order to make these solutions, these digital solutions work. Um, in order to exchange da data, in order to assess the data, et cetera. But at the same time, we know that there is a huge trade-off involved, uh, especially for companies, um, sharing data with, well, suppliers, with clients, but especially also with competitors within the same network um, due to patents, uh, business secrets, uh, you know it. Antitrust. Exactly, antitrust. So. Is this uh, this trade-off, is this a hot topic, just to get a bit of a feeling in Catena X? Is this something that is being discussed? Um, are there certain areas where it's uh, more relevant or more sensitive? And what is the overall impression? Is this something that can be tackled meaningfully? Um, yeah, just to get a bit of an impression uh, what is happening in Catena X regarding this issue. Um, this, this is a bit... Uh, uh, a big topic. Um... And that's, that's why I also mentioned in the in the opening statement. Um, I think everybody is conscious that this, the supply chain and how you build it is part of the competitive advantage because I think about 80% of, of the same OEMs uh, value um, uh, value creation is in the supply chain, not at the, the, the OEM um, itself. So um, how you structure the supply chain, how it looks like, is um, part of the competitive advantage. So we need to make sure that you only exchange the data you need to exchange for the, the purpose of the, the business case. And it's kind of free to join in a sense. And um, so we don't uh, provide um, the transparency of the, the structure of the supply chain to, to everybody or not. Even for the next level, you have a, we start off usually with a one up one down principle. So you can see your next level, um, and the underlying chain provides data, PCF is a, is a good example, or um, other KPIs, um, but um, the companies don't need to, to show the whole, um, the whole value chain and mm -hmm. supply chain to everybody. I think this is important. Mm -hmm. And technology also makes sure that it is really safe. It cannot, cannot be accessed without permission. Mm -hmm. We are also conscious that there are some use cases where you need to show more of the structure of the supply chain, but we need to have a governance to when to do that, what are the instances when we want to have more transparency, and it also needs to make clear in the governance that that is the purpose we're using the data, no others. Mm -hmm. I think the so, IMDS database is a good example how that can work. Okay, that's actually also a very good hint, actually, or a useful hint in that sense. So. Um, from how I understand you, it's actually both on the technological side, how the technology works, the architecture of the technology, different types of access to data, and on the other hand, of course, the governance structure that are important actually to aspects to consider in this regard. And um, I just let you note in the Q&A, um, a few questions are actually popping up to you. There seems to be quite some interest into, into Catena X. I would... If possible, I would like to ask with them uh, to answer some of them also in written form because I'm afraid we will not be able to to pick up all of them. I'll, um, I'll try to do that. Yeah. Uh, in the meantime, I would now get back to you, uh, Nathan. I already mentioned well collaboration now in terms of a bit like interoperability. Maybe again this issue, and perhaps you already answered the question to a certain extent. Um, uh, but still, as it is a hot topic, I would like to rephrase it in a bit of a more um, direct way. Um, given that this field of, of digital solutions and blockchain solutions is an emerging field with a lot of different providers, um, a lot of different efforts and projects going on, um, 
what to expect as a company. Does this mean that uh, perhaps, I don't know, in three to five years from now, we all have to use five different systems uh, in order to connect and interact um, with suppliers, with clients uh, and share data? Um, or what is the current state actually and what to expect or what is, what is the, the current trend that you see in this regard actually? I think the most important thing right now is, again, companies just getting out there and starting to share data and uh, getting some learnings so that they know what the what would uh, be the most important problems to solve. I think that <clears throat> when you're talking about things like chain of custody solutions, right, because this is usually what people are thinking of with blockchain traceability is chain of custody, but that is not the only thing that you can do. When you're thinking of chain, of chain of custody solutions, you're talking about a company that is maybe requesting data from their suppliers and then receiving it back, or maybe a company that is sending data to their customers in order to give them a better idea of what the, the material is and where it comes from. This may be run by the companies themselves, or it might be run by a third party. In all of these cases, when you're talking about getting data from two different systems to talk together, you've got an endpoint. You've got a, a company that is receiving shipments from two different or maybe three different suppliers that has data that's given in two or three different ways. Mm -hmm. The question is, how do you uh how how do, how do you get the those things to work together and the answer is going to be it's going to go on whatever data sharing system that the sender is using so if if i'm receiving three different shipments from three different suppliers and they're giving me data in three different formats and i want to include that in a shipment that I have that's going out, then I'm the one that's got to basically take it and put it together. And this is, the question is, can I just do that automatically? Can mm -hmm. that be, can those systems be interoperable? And the, the answer is, it depends. So if, it, if we really do not trust people to take data off of one system and put it onto another, interoperability becomes very difficult. Um, but maybe like maybe it makes more sense if you think of this in a blockchain way. The reason people like uh, uh, think about blockchain as a solution to supply chains is because blockchain is meant to uh, record transactions. Mm -hmm. If I send you one Bitcoin, if I send you a cryptocurrency, that will be recorded in the blockchain and it's unchangeable. And supply chain is looks very similar. It looks very similar because it's a series of transactions of materials moving, moving, moving. And, and, and so people think we can parallel that. And that gives a lot of control to the different actors along the, uh, the chain. Now, when we talk about interoperability in non-supply chain contexts, like you know, getting Ethereum to talk to Bitcoin or, and things like that, that's usually what, a, what someone thinks about is interoperability. And in order to get those two systems to talk together, you usually have a trusted third party to record that. That's what exchanges are. That's a problem if you don't trust everyone in the, in the system. In supply chain, it's different because you do need to trust some of the actors in the system. It, it may be flawed, but you've got things like third parties to, uh, uh, to monitor this, or maybe you have more trust if, if, if data is taken automatically. But the, the, the need to have an atomic swap that no party is trusted is less in a supply chain context because otherwise like you have no way of gathering data. Like, like the, there does need to be some level of trust. And so getting this data to move from one system to another is possible. And this is what I would term as practical interoperability. You can get this thing to work for all practical purposes. Now, the <laughs> then, the, and that's an important starting point because then you run into the question of, okay, do we trust everybody? Do, uh, and uh, even if you've got third party on, on site, mine site due diligence, you have to trust the third party. And we've seen with recent global witness reports that not all third parties are trustworthy. 
um, necessarily. And so, it, so when you're talking about supply chain, it's more about risk uh, and what risks you're willing to take and what data will help you manage those risks. Um, you know, I can get any two systems to at least share data and talk to each other. But the question is, can I get them to share that data in a way that is, that you would consider interoperable? And and that uh, I think that this is the fundamental disconnect here. I don't think it's going to be a scenario where five different service providers are providing information and a and an OEM is going to have to use all five of them much more likely scenario actually in the long term if you want me to prognosticate mm -hmm. is that as companies get more comfortable using these systems and sharing this data there's going to emerge some winning standards and then there's going to be some edge cases and so anyone that is a service provider is going to be using one of the main standards for scope three emissions or for supply chain due diligence or whatever and it might there might be some regionalization but it's going to be more on the data level. It's not going to be on the technological level in the long run. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if I understand you correctly, just the last uh, thing you said, actually, so we we will be looking at some winning kind of standards, protocols, etc., uh, that will then basically set the scene for the different tool providers how to interact and and then what. Okay, mm -hmm. I would I would expect so. And the mm -hmm. only reason that we're not seeing it now is because this uh, is because the system is fragmented and people aren't sharing data at scale right now. Yeah, yeah. So it's also, we are still at the very early stage in this regard, actually, to see where this goes. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see um, Anna would like to add something to this. Um, yes, indeed. I, I just wanted to bring this conversation a bit back of the per to the purpose, because we are speaking a lot about the technological challenges and what it takes to implement the system. But I think we all came here looking at digital solutions and blockchain as a means that can enable responsible sourcing. And when we look at it within that context, then there is also another aspect of trust that comes into play. Uh, that is for companies that are sharing their data through any platform, any solution, trusting in the use that is going to be made of that data. Because if we want to, to you know, bring it down, to explain it in a very simplistic way, when a company is conducting due diligence, essentially we look at information data that it has available to, to sense the level of risk that that supply chain or that product represents for that company and to take a decision on what to do about it. And of course, the guidelines that we have from the OECD and the, the type of frameworks and protocols that companies are very often required to follow um, from regulations or because of their code of conduct speak of risk mitigation. But there is also the challenge of the, or the possibility that that information is simply used for de-risking purposes. So that is where technology for itself cannot give a solution to this question of trust, but it is really a matter of um, dialogue within the supply chain, of communication, of getting an understanding of uh, how data is going to be used, what decisions are going to be taken on that, on that uh, basis, and also having um, in a way, a, a foundation of, of exchange and of collaboration between companies that will ensure that the supply chain is not going to be shaken by that, by that level of data or that level of transparency becoming, becoming available. And, and that's, I think, is also bringing us back to, to why companies might want or not want to share information. I think that the introduction of technology, yes, goes with technological challenges, but it also goes with the need for downstream and midstream and upstream companies to really engage with each other to get an understanding of why we are doing this exercise and what will, will be the, the results of it. Is this risk-based due diligence? Are, are, we, are we aiming for some specific impact as Audrey was, was saying? And what would be then the desire, desired behaviors or reactions of the different suppliers once that transparency is, is brought in? I think that there is a need for a broader dialogue there than just around the use and the implementation of the technology. Thank you, Anna. And I can I can actually see Nathan is 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 nodding his head and agreeing with that comment. And I think I would directly like to draw on this on this point and and turn a bit to you, Tanya. Um, it, 
very important point, Anna, that you that you mentioned now in terms of um, collaboration and exchange, and not just using the technology as such. So we should keep in mind actually the collaboration. This was precisely what was discussed yesterday, um, uh, and I mentioned it already. Uh, collaboration, not uh, just in terms of connecting the supply chain for reporting, for compliance, etc., but really to engage with each other, to uh, kind of exchange with each other, to learn from each other. Um, would you say, Tanya, from your experience that blockchain or other digital solutions maybe are really an enabler or facilitator for this kind of collaboration? Or is it in the end, lastly, still cons uh, kind of constrained or not more than, um, well, as I just said, for reporting reasons, for compliance, just individual kind of risk management uh, uh, approaches? Yeah. Uh, I think certainly blockchain is a tool for collaboration, and I think that's exactly uh, the, the difficult bit because, uh, you know, blockchain being a single source of truth uh, is a, a very scary concept because you have to bring parties that traditionally don't necessarily trust each other and bring in some third parties to check their information, uh, to suddenly have this information, this one single pot where they have access, you know, simultaneously, you then carry also responsibility for everything you've put on, uh, put out there. You know, I, I always say blockchain is not garbage and garbage out. Blockchain is garbage in, garbage forever. You are responsible for what you've put there because you can't then change it. And specifically in the mining world where I know, you know, the responsibility for our, for example, mineral resource estimates, there are many cases where later, you know, people put out a certain number and then, oh, but blah, 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 and some other files arrive by emails and corrections. Uh, and uh, I guess that's a, a scary bit, is it? but this is what eventually will work with the blockchain world because it will eventually benefit all the parties. You have to be more, you know, responsible for your own actions because it's a record that will be there, you know, for everybody to see whatever, of course, is open. And I think another mm -hmm. issue that we didn't highlight here is the fear of the technology in, in the mining world, because it's just a big world word and the level of understanding of the technology is still mm -hmm. very small like low it's a very shallow penetration in in the mining world uh, people you know still worry about such things as always oh, that excessive uh, electricity use if we you know start using blockchain do we have to pay for the humongous transaction fees you know oh we don't want to deal with cryptocurrency at all like the the level of understanding is still uh, very low in, in the industry sorry if i took off but mm -hmm. i think it's an important uh, thing to you know, mention is that there is still a lot of education that needs to happen uh, in the industry. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Tanya. Maybe directly following up on this, because this was also a discussion we had uh, actually in our briefing already for this uh, um, um, session. So please educate us a bit more, Tanya, especially on the point, um, uh, these concerns that are out there on blockchain. On the one hand, well, bad reputation of blockchain, because, yeah, well, we all know you mentioned the transaction cost. We know a huge carbon footprint of things like Bitcoin, etc., um, yeah, please, uh, just a few a few things on that. Is that something where we say, yes, these are real concerns uh, that need to be resolved um, or maybe perhaps even obstacles, uh, limitations? Yeah. Uh, I, I think these are the standard questions that I hear mm -hmm. from the mining companies because a lot of hearsay, you know, oh, how about that? You know, and then you have to say, oh, you have to educate them. There is a private blockchain, there is a public blockchain, mm -hmm. and even in the public blockchain, you know, the electricity costs are not so much of an issue anymore. Uh, or, you know, there is your private blockchain, which is not quite, you know, uh, an open, you know, the source and, and you, you, the security of the data always a lot of questions about the security of the data, the systems, mm -hmm. and, uh, um, you know, how do you release your data? Oh, my God, that's such a scary concept. Uh, but I think, you know, again, once the industry, the mining companies start to realize that they will actually have a better communication through that whole very long chain right now, uh, and, uh, you know, through the traders and, how this whole, you know, chain starts to congeal. Uh, I think that every every member of it, of course, the roles will change. It, it will. It will inevitably. And I think that's the power of this technology. And that's the scary bit, but that's the exciting bit. It, it really will change the way we would do things. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. I see, thanks, Tanya. I just see that Ursula is switching on her camera, probably indicating that we are coming to an end of the of the of the session already. Um, okay, keeping that in mind, um, just one very quick last statement, and I would really like to ask everyone not more than one to two sentences. If you have one single recommendation um, to a company uh, currently implementing or starting to implement such a blockchain solution, what would be your recommendation to that uh, to that company? Uh, what to take care of, um, what to be concerned about, or um, what to be aware of? And I would like to start maybe with you, Anna. Uh, thanks, Alex. And uh, I'll try to keep it very short. I think, I think that what we, we need next is a consolidation of the technology business case, but I think that's essentially there. But what I would advocate for is having a very clear proof of concept of how the technology supports due diligence. There is, I think, also a comment on that in the chat, Perfect. and I think that's what is needed now to really have that proof of concept and to make sure that everyone is informed of it. Proof of concept for due diligence. Perfect. Yeah. Um, Niels, perhaps I go on to you from your experience with Catena X. What is your recommendation to other companies when implementing such solutions? Yeah, make sure that it's interoperable with relevant networks in your industry out there. Cool. So the topic of interoperability, I can see this is really a main, a main point. Nathan, to you, what is typically your recommendation you give? To Get you? started, don't wait. The, everything, everything, everything depends on learnings, getting, uh, getting early traction, showing that this can work and proving it internally. Uh, getting started and not waiting to have to catch up later is the most important thing. Cool. Thanks, Nathan. Uh, we'll take that with us. And Tanya, please, the last statement is with you. Look beyond just traceability. How, see how blockchain technology can benefit your company. That's actually a very good message also. And I think we heard a few hints, uh, maybe in terms of smart contracts and on the technological side, maybe on the different use cases, for example, as you mentioned in news. And I think we should take this with us. And um, just my last comment from my side, um, we still have a few new questions. Perhaps our speakers can take a, a few more minutes, uh, take the time to have a look at them and answer wherever possible. Um, yeah, with that in mind, Thanks very much to all of you. Um, as expected, uh, time was running fast and there are still a lot of questions, um, but I guess uh, we will have other opportunities in the course of the resourcing project and we'll definitely catch up with you guys. Thanks a lot and back to you, Ursula. So I think now you can hear me. Yeah, indeed, it's my part of this conference to look at the time, to look at the overall time and so that I have to remind the groups to to come to an end. Thank you very, very much for your expert inputs and for the discussions we just heard. And I think it was a lot of things to think about and to digest. And that's why we would like to take a break now.